thousand songs. And it goes right in my pocket. Failure of the future has to be a nation that is agile, that is innovative, that is creative. Welcome to Future Square, the podcast all about innovation in the enterprise, brought to you and run by Collective Campus, an innovation hub based in Australia that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methodologies and tools to successfully explore new business models and disruptive innovation in an era of rapid change. For more information, go to www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Squared, everyone. Today, we're bringing you Alex Tapscott. He's a CEO and founder of Northwest Passage Ventures. For seven years in the Canadian and U.S. capital markets, Alex has worked tirelessly to help entrepreneurs realize their goals, raising hundreds of millions of dollars in critical growth capital and providing sound advice and counsel. A passionate advocate for the disruptive potential of new technology, Alex is also the co-author of Blockchain Revolution, How the Underlying Technology of Bitcoin is Changing Money, Business, and the World. Alex serves as a research fellow for the Global Solutions Network program at the Martin Prosperity Institute at the Rotman School of Business in Toronto. In 2014, he published the white paper, A Bitcoin Governance Network. Alex is also a strong supporter of mental health research and currently sits on the board of CAMH Engage, a young leadership council he co-founded at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. I personally found this chat to be incredibly insightful. Um, I thought it was of value to bring somebody who has a deep understanding of the underlying technology supporting Bitcoin, the blockchain, um, to our listeners and basically to find out a little bit more about not only the Bitcoin application but many of the profound impacts and applications that the blockchain technology can actually support in both Western and developing economies. So without further ado, I bring you Alex Tapscott. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you. Happy to be here. No, it's a pleasure. Um, So you're joining us all the way from Toronto, Canada. Yeah, that's right. Home of the Toronto Raptors. Yes, Toronto Raptors. Well, they're actually um, doing quite well this season. I know they finished, what, second in the, um, was it the Eastern Conference? Yep, they finished second. They had the best regular season on record, I believe. Mm. And uh, we just finished, we just started uh, the playoff run with um, a pretty ugly loss. Yeah, actually. yeah, to Indiana, yeah. right? That was yeah, it's Indiana. It's one of those things where Toronto sports teams, though they might have good regular seasons, oftentimes they end up choking in the playoffs. It's uh, part of the joy of being a Toronto sports yeah, team. So yeah. I'm hoping they can turn the tides a little bit here. Yeah, of so, so we've got a chance. Yeah, it's still early. Um, you know, as far as choking in the playoffs is concerned, for some reason or another, I decided I'd follow the Phoenix Suns back in 1993 when I was a wee young nine-year-old lad, and um, it's been nothing but a misery ever since. Even with great teams like the, the, the likes of, uh, you know, in the mid 2000s, we had Steve Nash. Uh, Sean Marion, Murray Stoudemire, and still just couldn't get over the line. So I feel your pain, Alex. Yeah, well, I think that makes you, I wouldn't say an honorary Canadian, but you're in our good books for, for liking Phoenix. Because I think, as you might know, Steve Nash is uh, yep. born and raised in Canada. Yeah, definitely. I'm a big, big Steve Nash fan. Um, watched his documentary as well uh, recently on, on Netflix, which we were talking about before the podcast started, which was quite um, quite interesting. And he also um, mentioned, I forgot the, the guy's name, actually eludes me, but he was um, a, a Canadian um, who basically limped on one leg from one side of Canada to the other back in the early 80s, raising money for um, cancer research. Yeah, Terry Fox. Terry Fox, Very that's right, yeah. Very yeah, now that was a... That was a you know, or inspiring documentary. I highly recommend anyone that's listening checks that out. That was just, you know, if you've got problems in your life, you watch that, you just realize how little your problems actually are and how you can overcome absolutely anything, which I thought was awesome. Yeah, well, it's called the, it's called the Marathon of Hope, the, the race that Terry Fox started. Well, it wasn't a race, but his goal mm. was to run a marathon across Canada. Yeah. And uh, the way he figured it out is he had to run a marathon every single day. So can you mm. imagine how difficult it is, say, for anybody to run a marathon once and he did it every single day for mm. i think about 160 days before he finally succumbed to um the cancer the yeah halfway but uh, the legacy lives on and uh yes yeah, great Canadian hero yeah definitely and I, and I think that was with a, a prosthetic limb which isn't anywhere near uh, the, the standard of today's limbs and i think his foundation has actually raised half a billion dollars up until now if i'm not mistaken but anyway um i, I digress from the topic of conversation today but um <laughs> 
That's a, it's an interesting one. But also, um, before we kick on, I know you're uh, you captained the Canadian Junior Rugby team back in 2007. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you, you've done your homework. Yeah. I, you... I, I, unlike a lot of Canadians, because I think uh, you know hockey's our, our big sport up here, I actually started playing rugby at a young age mm-hmm. and stuck stuck with the sport. Ended up playing in high school and university. Represented the province of Ontario on a few occasions as a teenager, and mm-hmm. finally. At the ripe old age of 19, got selected to play for the junior national team. So we never made it to Asia Pac, to Australia or anywhere out east, but we right. did have an opportunity to tour in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Uh, we toured in, in the island nations and the Caribbean, went to the States a couple times, um, played some, some high caliber rugby. So that was a real joy. Real mm. Well, that's quite, quite an interesting um, tale, obviously. You know, diverting from the tried and true uh, ice hockey track that most Canadians are brought up on, um, and I guess that yeah, and, yep, and and no cauliflower ears too, which is nice. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no George St. Pierre uh, ears, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> fair enough. Um, well, I guess in, in the in the true nature of an entrepreneur is to uh, think a little bit laterally and maybe not do three things by the books, um, and. Well, uh, I'll use that as a segue. And speaking of books, um, you've recently <laughs> co-authored Blockchain Revolution, How the Underlying Technology of Bitcoin is Changing Money, Business, and the World. Um, so you obviously co-authored this with Don Tapscott, who is your dad. Um, he's 15 times That's author right. of books such as Wikinomics and Macroeconomics. And I guess congratulations are in order. The book, which is yet to be released, it doesn't come out until May the 10th, hit number one in the banking category on Amazon last week. So congrats. Yeah, thank you very much. It's um, it's odd for a book to, to top the charts when it hasn't been released, unless mm. it's uh, its name is Harry Potter or The Hunger Games. So yeah. that was uh, quite 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 uh, satisfying for us. And uh, yeah, we're hoping that the book is is read by a lot of people because we think the subject is critically important to business and to mm-hmm. mankind. Yeah. Couldn't agree more, and um, I guess we'll be digging a little bit deeper on that topic today. So, I mean, our audience may be quite familiar with Bitcoin, um, but many may not quite yet grasp the concept of the blockchain. Um, Can you give our audience a high-level rundown of what the blockchain actually is, Alex? Sure. So, we've been spending, actually, the past two years researching this technology. Um, Started first with a, a research project that Don Hapsat, my dad, was running at the University of Toronto mm-hmm. and had snowballed into this book. And in those two years of research, we've basically come to the conclusion unequivocally that blockchain technology is the second generation of the digital revolution. Mm-hmm. So the first generation brought us the internet of information. The second generation, powered by blockchain, is bringing us the internet of value. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean? Well, blockchain essentially, and it's a simple and ingenious concept, uh, it's a revolutionary protocol that allows transactions to be simultaneously anonymous and secure, peer-to-peer, mm-hmm. instant, and frictionless. And it does this not by processing transactions through uh. an intermediary or a third party, which is traditionally how the global economy has been organized, yep. but, but rather through a large global network, which through mass collaboration, clever code, and some pretty ingenious cryptography, actually enables these transactions and as an added benefit creates this tamper-proof public ledger of basically every transaction that's ever happened on the network. So when you hear about blockchain, you're actually talking, people are discussing that tamper-proof ledger, but we look at it more broadly as a new medium for value. Right. So inform- information, think about say 40 years ago, everything of information used to be consumed in a different medium. You know, you used to send mail, you used to read newspapers, you used to listen to records, you used to go to the movie theater to watch a film. Um, people had printed out presentations, they printed out um, documents, uh, books, etc. Basically, all of that um, information has moved to a digital format, the internet. So now, all of those things, more or less, we consume through the web. Mm-hmm. Value, value, on the other hand, doesn't have a digital native format. So even today, though you might log into your bank account on the internet or pay with a credit card at a, at a digital terminal and might think that you're using a digital format, most things of value are actually still have one foot in the analog age. So right. money, contracts, uh, stocks, bonds, mm-hmm. titles, deeds, all of these different forms of value 
uh, are still basically uh, isolated within different silos. Right. And so what that does, that creates uh, friction in the economy. It creates uncertainty because mm -hmm. these records are um, not necessarily stored in a secure fashion. And generally speaking, it adds cost. And it also has the added uh, disadvantage of making the entire global economy exclusionary. So by that I mean there are billions of people in the world who have access to the digital tools mm -hmm. to uh, use the internet, smartphones, flip phones, uh, prepaid internet through um, uh, prepaid cards, but they actually don't have access to banking. So for example, in a place like Nicaragua, 90% mm -hmm. of people have, connect have connectivity, but only about 8% have access to financial services. That's a big problem. And the big problem really is that even though the internet was good for information, um, you still needed an intermediary to do a few things. You still needed an intermediary to establish identity, to create a trusting relationship, and to perform all of the business logic and transaction logic, which is settling, clearing, and processing transactions. Mm -hmm. What blockchain enables is for people to do business and exchange value um, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Right. And that's a, revolution and that's a revolutionary, revolutionary idea which to date has been yet unrealized, but we now finally have the tools at our disposal to make it happen. Right. So basically what you're saying is that the blockchain supports the uh, democratization of value. That's a great way of putting it. Where did you uh, pick that up from? Oh, I picked that up from one of your uh, keynotes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's true. Um, you know, the Internet democratized information. If you think about how much it would have cost for us to conduct this call, you're in Australia and I'm in Canada. Mm -hmm. We could very easily be video conferencing right now. For us, the video conference in 1985 would have required the Canadian and Australian um, military to mobilize, um, you know, satellites to beam images to use up their entire network in order for us to make that happen. It probably mm -hmm. cost millions of dollars. We can now do that basically for free. And anybody with access to the internet has the same ability to communicate and collaborate online and access information. That's right. But again, they don't, have the, they don't have the ability to be a free and independent economic actor. So blockchain has the ability to make um, what we do in business and what we do in finance as easy and frictionless as, as it is for us to conduct this call across the world. Mm, yeah. No, I like what you said there about you know the, us actually speaking on the phone right now. And um, we were speaking um, about this podcast before recording and basically saying how it was literally kicked off about three months ago. And in that time, you know, we've had a star-studded array of guests. But if it was maybe even five years ago or, or, or less, perhaps, you know, to set up a, a podcast, to contact people from the other side of the world, to run this, it would have cost a lot more. Whereas today, literally, all it takes is a Skype connection, um, a pair of headphones, and off you go. You know, an email account, send out some emails, and, and you're done. So the barriers to entry have never been lower. Um, and I guess um, on that democratization of value, um, you've talked about places like Nicaragua and developing economies where people essentially become their own sort of banks, if you will. Um, do you want to perhaps elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so today we're in the, we're in the grip of uh, a very troubling prosperity paradox. Mm -hmm. That's how we define it in the book which is to say that the global economy is growing, but fewer and fewer people are benefiting. You've got big issues in the world. Youth unemployment is stubbornly high in many places. Medium incomes, after going unabated for many decades, is actually slipping mm -hmm. in the developed world. And the rise of the Internet has really done very little, actually, to alleviate the bureaucratic growth and inefficiency in what we call the developing world, which mm -hmm. ends up stranding millions of dollars of dead money yeah. in the dark economy. So blockchain technology basically creates a world of possibilities to reverse all of these trends. Mm -hmm. We now have a, peer, a true peer-to-peer -peer platform that enables uh, personal economic empowerment. Uh, we can own our own identities and our own personal data. Uh, you can do transactions, we can store value, we can fund and invest. So in, in discussing the, among many other things, so in discussing the opportunity for the developing world, um, the problem really resides in the global financial system as it exists today, mm -hmm. which is that the global financial system is uh, antiquated. Much of the technology that runs it is actually 30 or 40 years old, and we still uh, use things like uh, paper checks, which actually have their origins in the sort of medieval yeah. time. Yeah. Um, it's uh, concentrated and entrenched, which is to say that um, 
a few big players control large swaths of the industry, and because it's so entrenched, uh, it's a very resistant to change, and it's, as a result, exclusionary, which means that many people in the world don't have access to financial services. And one of the reasons they don't is because banks can't reliably determine identity mm -hmm. as people who live in the developing world because they might not have a passport, a driver's license, yeah, yeah. a utility bill, or any of the things we usually use in North America to establish identity. And they often don't have enough assets to really make it worthwhile for a bank. You know, the average cost of opening a bank account in Canada from a bank's perspective, or the United States for that matter, is a few hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So if the, person, if the person you're trying to target as a customer only has a few hundred dollars uh, in deposits and they want to just open a checking account, account it's really not worth your while. So uh, blockchain affects this in two ways. Number one, it radically lowers the cost for banks to uh, perform their roles in the global economy. Mm -hmm. So banks, banks perform a few key functions, and I won't go through all of them, but many of those things uh, involve cost to the banks. If you have a completely new technology platform that lowers cost, the cost of doing business, that makes it easier for them to target new customers. The bigger opportunity, though, I think it's for new entrants, technology companies that want to leverage this new platform um, to open up the world's unbanked to the global economy. Mm. And they can do this in, in a number of ways. Um, anybody today can go onto uh, the internet and buy Bitcoin. And in a lot of parts of the developing world, um, there are Bitcoin ATMs that allow you to exchange the physical cash, cash which is pervasive in the economy for Bitcoin, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden you can become a member of the global economy. That's interesting, and I, I think you're going to see Bitcoin grow in importance, especially in places where local currencies are extremely unreliable, right. and that happens to uh, encompass about you know, two-thirds of the entire world. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think that for most people, um, buying Bitcoin is a foreign concept, and so it's going to be up to the technology companies to use this technology in a way that's completely seamless, which is to say people don't actually know that the underlying technology is based on blockchain, but what they see um, on their phones is all the services they might normally get with a bank. Yeah. Which is to say, a place to a place to store value reliably that's not pigs or goats or land which has a, a tenuous title. Mm. They have a place to move value, uh, make payments, pay for goods and services, uh, make remittances to their uh, their families at home. A way to get access to credit, which is really critical. Uh, most people in the world have no access to credit, and credit is a precondition for a lot of entrepreneurs to mm -hmm. build companies and to um, you know, create value. And it will give them a way to fund and invest whatever they make into interest-bearing or potentially um, you know, lucrative investments which is really just to say a way to you know, become an investor in the economy, which most people in the developed world are not. Yeah. And all of that's possible because of blockchain technology. So it's a big opportunity for banks to um, seize this new moment in time to go after billions of unbanked people, which is a huge market opportunity. And it's an equal, equally interesting opportunity for those new entrants to leverage this new technology platform to... Um, to proceed the banks and to become uh, dominant in those markets, so it's a really exciting opportunity. And the, the big, the big, you know, picture here is that this is a very good thing. Financial inclusion is a prerequisite for uh, economic prosperity, mm -hmm. and for those people who don't have it, they are permanently barred from um, realizing the fruits of global growth. Well, that's exactly right. And I think you touched on quite a few interesting concepts there, Alex. Um, I mean, one, I think you mentioned that uh, number one type of transaction in developing economies tends to be um, remittances, um, inflows from the diaspora around the world. Um, but oftentimes in developing economies, people have to trek, particularly in parts of Africa, for hours to actually, um, you know, basically, you know, visit the local Western Union, um, which is fraught with dangers um, of, of many kinds, but also physical degradation. Um, the fact that there's the opportunity cost where they could be spending those hours um, trekking to the local Western Union, doing other things, maybe working, maybe spending time with family. There's so many other flow-on effects of that. And also this whole concept of microloans, which is um, you know, incredibly important. I mean, you touched on the fact that you know, entrepreneurs need some type of seed funding to actually actually help them develop something of value and, and grow rather than just rely on you know foreign aid and things of that nature and um, you know the application of Bitcoin may help to um, empower people to you know just grow their own little mini businesses and empower themselves to you know live better lifestyles in developing economies 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's dead on. So two points. Number one, yes, you're right. There's no banking infrastructure in most of the developing world. Mm. So in places, in places like Africa, it's the most pronounced, unsurprisingly, and mm. as well as some of the poorest places in Central Asia, like Afghanistan, uh, where there are maybe one or two bank branches for every 100,000 people. Kind yeah. of like how there are one or two doctors for every 100,000 people. Mm. We, know what the state, we know what the state of health is like in many of those parts of the world. So... Um, like with, with telephony, where we completely leapfrog the uh, physical infrastructure of landlines and went straight to sell, uh, I think you're going to see a similar leapfrogging of traditional financial infrastructure straight to blockchain mm. in a lot of parts of these worlds. And it's incredibly important that this happens. You mentioned remittances, and uh, the numbers on remittances are quite staggering. So the largest uh, source of fund flows into the developing world as you said, are not foreign aid, and they're actually not direct foreign investment, which mm. you see with China investing in Africa, spending billions of dollars. It's actually remittances, yep. small payments, many millions of them that are made from diasporas living abroad to communities in the home country. $600 billion last year. The average, wow. fees, that people pay, the average fees that people pay on that are anywhere between 8 and 10%. Uh, in many corridors of the world, a corridor is just a, you know um, between two countries. Mm. It can run as high as twenty percent. So we're levying this tax, this enormous tax, or the financial system, that is, on the poorest people in the world who are sending money home um, to people where it has the greatest benefit. Uh, world Bank studies show that most remittance uh, payments are spent on critical um, life-saving things. Food, mm -hmm. shelter, water, yep. electricity, um, the kinds of things people need to live a decent life. And so there's this huge tax. So that's a big problem. Um, enter blockchain, which is uh, solving this. And more specifically, entrepreneurs who are using this technology to create financial services for the world on deck. Mm -hmm. And there are a few great examples of, of companies like this. Um, one of them is a company called Abra, which is based in Silicon Valley and is uh, building remittance corridors between the United States and the Philippines, India, China, and other locations, mm -hmm. where for the cost of one fifth or one quarter of a bit of a of a percent, so 25 basis points, you can send money home in five minutes. Whereas the wow. Western Union, it costs anywhere between seven and ten percent, eight mm -hmm. and ten percent, and and can not only cost a lot of money, but also takes five to seven days in some instances. And as you mentioned. Is a huge hassle, which um, you know prevents people from earning when they're doing this. So this is a big opportunity. Another company in Canada called Paycase is doing similar work, mm -hmm. and other companies around the world, including some homegrown in, in Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere, uh, are doing the same thing. Yeah. So I think it's only a matter of time before um, we think of using applications on our phone to send remittances in the same way that people living in Canada, the United States, and Australia. Think about calling your family um, at home, and uh, and again, mm. that, that's you know not only is that a huge economic benefit for the countries who are receiving remittances. For example, in the Philippines, remittances are thirteen percent. So taking ten percent out would add literally one point three percent to the GDP. Think about that for a second. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also, but also for the individuals themselves, uh, having more money to spend on the things they need. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. And um, just on foreign aid, Alex, I know you've mentioned that it essentially exacerbates problems in countries it's delivered to, um, oftentimes due to things like corrupt officials. Um, can you perhaps uh, elaborate on how the underlying blockchain technology helps improve accountability? Absolutely. This is one of those, these really troubling statistics that you uncover when you're researching a book like this, mm -hmm. which is that foreign aid has no discernible positive impact yeah. on uh, communities that receive it. In <laughs> fact, the evidence suggests that um, countries that receive foreign aid yep. suffer more. Wow. So how, how on earth is that possible? Well, what ends up happening with foreign aid is that it has to travel through intermediaries. And the last intermediary, uh, usually, is the local government. Mm -hmm. Now, unsurprisingly, perhaps, the local governments in places that most need foreign aid are the ones that also generally tend to be the most uh, corrupt and the most ineffective. Yeah. And so what ends up happening is that funds get just straight up appropriated, stolen, 
uh, before they reach the final source, yeah. or they end up in or they end up in the wrong hands, and that shows all sorts of social problems. This war creates um, problems where none existed before. Mm -hmm. And so, with blockchain technology, yes, there is an opportunity to improve how foreign aid is delivered. First and foremost, um, if the goal is to just send monetary aid to send money to communities, uh, you can do so now in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. So. Imagine there's a, an orphanage in a small African country yep. that UNICEF that UNICEF runs, and they want to make sure that the kids who are in that orphanage have an opportunity to get a decent education, and when they graduate, um, have enough money to buy animals, to buy a little bit of land, and start a decent life. Mm -hmm. Right now, the only way to do that is to go through the intermediaries, who, as I said, are extremely unreliable. Right. Um, an alternative would be for the orphanage and the individual kids to set up their own accounts in trust, mm -hmm. and not in trust with with a with a lawyer or with a local bank or with a government, but rather through a smart contract, which is basically a mechanism that lives on the blockchain that guarantees execution. So mm -hmm. the guaranteed execution in this case could be every year money that's donated to UNICEF routes to the bank account of the kids who are in the orphanage. No one else can access it except for the kids who would have a private key to open up that money. Yep. And on a certain predetermined date, say the day they turn 16 or 18, um, the smart contract executes so that the money comes out of the digital escrow account and is available for the kids to spend. Mm. At no point can any, there's no point can any corrupt official, local strongman, or any other uh, criminal um, take that money away. Yep. And that would, give, that would give them an opportunity to start off with a decent life. Now, there are some instances in foreign aid where um, more than just a monetary commitment are needed, where you actually need boots on the ground to get things done. So think about the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. It's one of the worst natural disasters in um, yeah. modern times, yeah. uh, certainly, certainly in, in Haiti's recent history. And to their credit, the global community mobilized and ended up making donations of like a half a billion dollars mm -hmm. to the Red Cross alone. Wow. And about half a billion dollars was meant to um, basically go to Haiti and, and provide immediate relief in the form of food, shelter, water, etc. But more long term to build 130,000 permanent residences, residences for many of the people who had been displaced. Mm -hmm. The only problem is they didn't build 130,000 homes, they built six homes. Wow. Not, not 6,000 or 600. Crazy. Yep. And it turns out that um, the Red Cross and the local government, in many instances, weren't acting with integrity. Money was, was squandered or, or misspent or, or just went missing. Mm. So there, there are two problems here. Um, number one is there was no accountability uh, to the people who made the donations as to how that money got spent. Mm -hmm. So going back to this idea of smart contracts, imagine that you could program the money that you donated so that it only got released to the aid group when certain milestones were met. Yeah. So, you want to build houses in Haiti. Great. Um, send out an RFP, find a contractor, uh, make, the, make the process available online for everyone to vet. Mm -hmm. Okay, you did that, good. Let's release really some of the money for you to go to stage two. Stage two is secure all of the raw materials that you will need. Good. More money gets released. Secure the title of the piece of land that you plan on building this home. Okay, more money gets released. And then upon the uh, completion of the final project, the last part of the money gets released. What this does is creates accountability and transparency in foreign aid. And I yeah. think that uh, for, for aid organizations, though they might uh, bristle at the idea of having kind of oversight, really this is a way for the masses and those people who support these aid groups to hold them accountable for what they're doing. Mm. And that's ultimately uh, a very powerful uh, force for change. Yeah. The second thing, the second problem with what happened in Haiti uh, was that the land title to the piece of property that the Red Cross was supposed to build these houses mm. was an utter shambles where five, six, ten people had duplicate claims to um, different pieces of land. Many of those people who had a claim to the land happened to be local government officials who were obviously corrupt and trying to take advantage of the situation. Mm -hmm. So this is a big problem in the developing world. There's an economist uh, based in Peru called Hernando de Soto, who's really, I think, the world's expert at, um, at looking at how developing world economies work. And he concluded 
that about five and a half billion people in the world, which is really to say everyone outside of North America, Europe, and uh, you know Australia and New Zealand, mm-hmm. uh, and, cert- and certain places, I guess, like Hong Kong and Singapore, have a very tenuous right to the land they live on. And th- we see this play out day in and day out. The Honduran president was kicked out of office through a nonviolent coup mm-hmm. for expropriating land from locals to give to his buddies. The uh, governments in Brazil expropriated land from favela dwellers to build stadiums for the Rio games yeah. without giving them any fair compensation because they didn't have secure title to the land. And of course in Haiti, where as a result of this big problem, 130,000 of the poorest people in the world went homeless. So wow. how could blockchain change that? Well, as I said, um, one of the residual benefits of this new platform for value is the creation of this immutable ledger database mm-hmm. that shows uh, the history of what has happened and is unhackable and secure. Well, how, how, why not try and put a land title registry on this platform where no single person or government or corrupt official could change um, the results of that ledger only uh, through mass collaboration and consensus of the network could anything change. So you'd have a more perfect picture of who owns what. And sure, it's only as good as um, as the government's ability to enforce it. And this is an important caveat. So mm. if you've got a, if you've got a uh, land title that's on the blockchain, so to speak, and someone comes to your house at gunpoint, um, having that is not enough to save your life. Mm. That's just, that's just the truth of it. But you know what? Um, Transparency is a very powerful tool. And if you've got a a record of who owns what on the poorest places in the world, the government tries to act against that, they're going to feel the pressure of the international community, which might include NGOs, foreign governments, and also the individuals themselves in the country who hopefully, knowing that the government is acting, knowing with 100% certainty that the government is acting illegally, will stand up to them. And I think that kind of... um, positive social pressure can actually change behavior. So this is something that, though a bigger challenge, is actually the bigger opportunity of blockchain. So there are 2.5 billion people who don't have bank accounts. There are 5.5 billion who don't have title to their land. If we can solve the title issue, you unlock a world of possibilities Mm. for economic inclusion. Land, Land is a prerequisite to so many things that we take for granted in the developed world. You know, how do you take, how do you borrow money? Well, you secure it against your house. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you, how do you save and invest? Well, you buy a home, you pay it on a mortgage, and hopefully over time it appreciates in value, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually the, the basis of, of so much economic prosperity in the developed world, and nobody, nobody in the developing world really um, has access to it. So wow. that's a huge opportunity that's possible for us. Yeah, so it's becoming quite apparent that there's so many profound um, impacts of the blockchain technology far and you know, above and beyond what people normally hear in the, in the media, which is purely just about the exchange of Bitcoin um, in, in Western economies. Um, and you, know, you touched on quite a few interesting points there, Alex, particularly around the uh, milestone payments. You, know, in, you, you look at, for example, venture capital and startup investments, usually they're tied to some type of milestones. You know, anything in the Western economy, we don't just say, okay, here's a ton of money, go do it. Except when it comes to um, not-for-profits, charities, uh, foreign aid, oftentimes that is the case. You know, we just give you a bag of money up front and hope that you know, you'll allocate it appropriately. Um, but the fact of the matter is that you know, foreign aid is only as good as the people who it's given to to administer it. And oftentimes that's where things fall over, um, as you've clearly and perfectly illustrated there. Um, and you also mentioned that, you know, you clearly articulated that there are more uses to uh, blockchain technology than just Bitcoin, such as, you know, land titles, for example. Um, and I know you've previously mentioned that blo- uh, Bitcoin is to blockchain what email is to the internet. So, um, do you want to perhaps just touch on some of the other um, applications um, of the blockchain technology, whether it is in developing economies or developed economies? Happy to. So as part of the book, we actually, the book itself is actually the byproduct of seven separate research projects mm-hmm. that, we were, that, we, that we launched over the past couple of years to try and better understand this technology. Um, what I've done over the past half an hour or so is actually just speak to two of them which is the financial services opportunity, yep. which is uh, our, our chance here to reinvent the way that uh, markets work and how people access them. 
and the prosperity opportunity, mm -hmm. which is to say, how do we bring more people into the global economy? How do we pre-distribute wealth, which is to say, give them the opportunity to create wealth in the first, first place, rather than just redistribute wealth, which really is the only solution we've come up with. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty powerful shift that I think can, can uh, create a lot of good in the world. So what, what are the other five? <laughs> seven. <laughs> I don't think we have time for all no. of them, but, but I will discuss a couple. So one of the things we looked at was the corporation itself, which is an artifact of society that's become one of our most important institutions and the foundation really of, of wealth over mm -hmm. the past 150 years, the company. Um, and we looked at it through the lens of a, of a well-known economist named um, Ronald Coase. Right. And Ronald Coase, 1932, asked a deceptively simple question. He said, why do we have corporations? Mm -hmm. After all, it's the best way to organize capability and allocate resources to the economy in the open market, a la Adam Smith. Yep. Um, wh why not have every different part of the company be its own independent contractor? How come um, you know, supply chain, finance, marketing, manufacturing, sales, et cetera, aren't all doing things in, in an open market? Mm -hmm. And he pointed to one thing, transaction costs. And said that so long as the transaction costs are higher in the open market than they are inside the boundaries of the company, companies will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. So in the old days, we had the vertically integrated corporation like the Ford Motor Company, right. which not only made cars, it also had a steel plant, it had a rubber plantation called Fordlandia in Brazil. Mm -hmm. It had it had a timber mill. Uh, its plant in Detroit put in raw steel on one end and produced Model Ts on the other end. And that's because for Henry Ford, and he knew this before a lot of other people had made it, um, you know, academic knowledge, mm -hmm. that it was cheaper for him to be vertically integrated than to, to contract in the open market. Okay? Yep. So uh, the internet changed that a little bit. It, um, it enabled us to uh, improve the cost of search, improve the cost of communication, and improve the cost of collaboration. So search means we were able to find out the best price for a certain service. So people started to realize it was cheaper to put call centers in India mm -hmm. than it was to have them in the United States. And communication, all of a sudden, we no longer had to keep everything in the boundaries of the company because we could connect for free on the Internet right. um, with anybody all over the world. And so we, as, from, as a result, we got the extended enterprise. You know, the, the mantra of the 90s was, do what you focus on what you do best and outsource the rest. Yes. But if you look at the com if you look at the company today, it kind of looks like it did 25 years ago. In fact, it kind of looks like it did uh, at the end of the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say, it's still hierarchical, it's still pretty traditional, um, and in many respects, it's still pretty vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. And the big reason is that the real transaction costs are not search, they're not communication, they're not collaboration, they're bargaining contracting, and policing and enforcing contracts, right. all of which really haven't changed in price or friction or speed over the past 50 years. We still rely on intermediaries to do all of those things. Mm -hmm. So if you have a technology that allows bargaining and contracting and the policing and enforcing contracts to be automatic uh, and guaranteed, then you can start to think of all new types of business models mm -hmm. that I think will fundamentally reshape the global economy. So in the book, we actually identified seven new business models, and I'd encourage uh, your listeners to pick up a copy of Blockchain Revolution yep. to learn all about this. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Where can they get copies, Alex? They can pre-order them on Amazon now. Yep. Uh, the, best way, the best way is to do so in massive volume. Mm -hmm. um, all, your, all your friends and family, I'm sure, will want a of copy. Of course. No, I, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, but not really. So... Uh, <laughs> So looking at the, at the new business model, mm -hmm. uh, I won't go through all of them, but, but one of them is um, what we call the rights creators. And this really hits to the core of a lot of creative industries, like, say, music. So the music industry has gone through a whole bunch of transformations over the past 50 years, uh, first from the recorded album, you know, uh, records, CDs, tapes, to the digital age where we had iTunes, to where we're at now, which is the, uh, the streaming revolution yeah. that happened with companies yeah. like Spotify. Now, um, in that period of time, things have only gotten worse for the people who actually create the music. It used to be that a songwriter, if they sold a million copies of a song, 
could expect to receive about fifty thousand mm. um, dollars, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, if you're a songwriter and that's your job, that's enough to, to you know yeah. live. Yeah. These days, if you listen to a, a thousand, sorry, excuse me, a million streams on Spotify, that same songwriter will get about thirty-five dollars. Wow. So you're talking you're talking about economics, which are um, hugely asymmetric, where all the benefits going to these intermediaries like Spotify, none of it's going to the artist. Yeah. I, and one of the reasons why is that. Um, music is one of those things we think of as information, but actually it's an asset. Mm -hmm. So if you can extend the principle of blockchain from Bitcoin, which is to say uh, digital cash that you can move from peer to peer, to music, which is a digital file of value that you can move from peer to peer, mm -hmm. you can start to think about new, new ways of, of organizing the music industry. And there's actually a company in, um, in the United States uh, called Ujo Music, and mm -hmm. another one called Mycelia, which is being organ, which is being run really by a Grammy Award-winning singer-songwriter named Imogen Heap, mm -hmm. and they have developed they've developed a platform to change the music industry. And here's how it works: you go on to uh, Ujo Music, and uh, you see there's a song available. If you want to uh, listen to the song, it can be it's free. If you want to download the song, it costs a dollar. If you want to radio play it, let's say your radio station you want to play it, it costs, you know, half a cent. Mm -hmm. If you're Spotify and you want to stream that piece of music, you contract with Ujo and you stream it for a tenth of a penny. If you want to sample the drum track for commercial purposes, or if you want to use the song in an advertisement, it costs a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand dollars. You can't access it online because it's one of these, it's because it's represented on the blockchain, it can only exist in one place. Mm -hmm. So the only way to, to buy it is to do so on a peer-to-peer -peer basis from the artists themselves. What does that mean for the economics? Well, essentially, if a, the song costs a dollar, 99 cents of that goes to the artist, and the other penny goes to Ujo for providing technology. So that's a really interesting development. Um, an even more potentially revolutionary idea is the idea of ensuring that all the creators of content mm -hmm. get uh, the fair share of the value that's created. So right now, it's difficult to divide the spoils of a piece of music between a hundred different collaborators. Right. Because to, 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 um, do, to execute a hundred different royalty agreements through a publisher um, is costly and to um, you know, make those payments is prohibitively expensive. Mm -hmm. But with blockchain, you can take a song and divide it into a thousand different components with a thousand people who are involved in making it happen. You can say like a recording of a symphonic piece of music might be a good example for mm -hmm. a lot of collaborators. And you can ensure that every single one of those people is guaranteed payment um, every time the song is monetized, and regardless of how it's monetized. And they get paid instantly uh, with guaranteed execution. And I actually know this from a personal level, because my father-in-law is a composer for film and television. Right. And he gets, paid, he gets paid royalties every quarter they arrive in the mail. Sometimes they're for you know fifty bucks. Sometimes they're for a hundred bucks. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. they're for a thousand bucks. And he really has no transparency as to why it's one way or the other. And occasionally the checks don't arrive. And to to try and reclaim one of these um, you uh -huh. know checks is incredibly costly and time consuming mm -hmm. because you're dealing with intermediaries all over the world who are using different systems, who speak different languages, who are talking to different uh, law firms, and it just becomes a complete nightmare. So this is a technology that can improve the state of affairs for artists in a really profound way. Yeah. And that's one of seven that's one of seven new business models that you've identified. Wow, it's interesting. Well I highly recommend our listeners uh, get a copy of your book to find out about the other six. Um, but yeah, I mean music industry is an interesting one. I mean what we've seen over the last five to ten years is that bands and, and artists are relying predominantly on touring and merchandise to, to make a living and have to tour relentlessly, um, which obviously has an impact on their lives and, and has a strain on their personal relationships and whatnot. And you know, it's it's simply not enough to just release an album and even if that album hits number one on the charts, chances are you're probably not going to make all that much from it and definitely not enough to sustain um, you know, your lifestyle on an ongoing basis, which is kind of sad given all the um, blood, sweat and tears that goes into um, the creation of music. Um, but Alex, I think I just wanted to quickly touch on some of the criticisms of the blockchain technology. Um, one around uh, price volatility. So Bill Gates recently said that you know his foundation doesn't use Bitcoin because, and I quote, the poor shouldn't have a currency whose value goes up and down a lot compared to their local currency. If a mistake is made in who you pay, then you need to be able to reverse it. So anonymity wouldn't work. Um, what are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I want to be clear that Bitcoin is one component of blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of use cases that don't involve Bitcoin as a speculative asset. Right. Where the technology powers transactions and powers new business models uh, that have nothing to do with Bitcoin. Um, but your but your criticism, but that's not the script of the question because I think it's a very good one. Mm -hmm. uh, which is what? How do you deal with these um, big challenges? And we actually have a chapter in the book that deals with this. It's called Showstoppers. Sure. Ten big things that could go wrong to prevent this from reaching its potential. Mm -hmm. um, price volatility is one of those things that I actually am not that concerned about. Sure. Um, simply because relative to a lot of developed world currencies, it is volatile, but for many people in the world, it's actually a bastion of stability. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, in, over time, the volatility has decreased significantly, where um, Bitcoin really is starting to have the properties of a currency, uh, which is to say, it's liquid, it's fungible, um, it's a good store of value, and mm -hmm. we're getting there. But your question about anonymity is, is a good one. Um, and so in the in the book, the, the 10 showstoppers, I won't go through all of them, but there are these big questions, which is that if it's anonymous, could it be used as a tool for criminals? Could it right. be used as a tool for money launderers? Mm -hmm. um, could it be used potentially even as a tool for uh, financing uh, terrorist activity? And these are, these are all good questions. Um, and the fears, though, I think are, are a little bit misplaced. Um, actually, a lot of regulators and law enforcement agencies don't really mind Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is actually much easier to track than cash. About mm -hmm. two and a half trillion dollars of crime happens every year um, in cash. And that's actually one of the reasons why they're trying to eliminate the thousand um, Swiss franc note and the 500 euro note is because it just makes moving that value that much easier. Uh, Bitcoin, by contrast, is actually not anonymous. It's pseudonymous. So um, you can actually, with enough ingenuity, trace back how Bitcoin gets spent uh, to their original source. And if you have some other um, information, some context around that, you have a pretty good chance of identifying um, who's doing the wrong thing in, in a transaction. Right. Now, that happens after the fact, and in the meantime, uh, damage can happen to people, and that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to resolve that by um, thinking long and hard about how you govern and regulate this stuff. Now. Um, I've gotten into hot water before in the past of saying that Bitcoin and blockchain need governance um, because I think a lot of people view this as sort of anti-governance, mm. resistance of, of, the, of the banking industry, it's resistant to um, you know, federal governments and, and intergovernmental organizations. But the truth is you need different stakeholders participating um, when you're trying to develop uh, an important global resource like mm -hmm. blockchain. And in the in example of the internet, we had lots of different stakeholders developers, government, civil society organizations, corporations, who came together, and though it was messy and hardly perfect, actually developed a working governance network for the internet. And today, the, the internet is not owned by a company, it's not controlled by a government, so the, the U.S. government does have an outsized influence. To be clear, leadership is, is everyone's personal opportunity. It's not like there's some preordained leaders of the blockchain revolution. Anybody who has an interest in making this successful mm -hmm. can and should get involved. And that's the kind of um, organizing principle that the blockchain uh, governance network should have, which mm -hmm. is that it should be totally open and totally meritocratic. And I think that's how you prevent a lot of these uh, showstoppers, dark, dark side issues from happening. And uh, just going back to the book, so we did identify 10 different things. You mentioned a couple. And, uh, you know, we looked at them, and some of them are significant. More significant, perhaps, is the question of anonymity and volatility. Mm. Like, for example, um, how do you scale this technology? Uh, the Bitcoin blockchain handles 10 transactions a second. The um, Visa network handles 5,000. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how is it that we're able to uh, take this technology and scale it for use cases that are global uh, in, in reach? And there are many of them, not just for payments or financial services, but for the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the, in the future, there'll be billions of connected devices communicating, transacting, um, making payments uh, independent of human intervention. Those payments can't go through a bank. They can't, you can't use the Visa network to make thousands of payments, um, you know, every minute if you're a, a device that's metering or streaming some service. So you need to create a new way to make payments. So I think blockchain is the answer. Mm. But again, that requires a big leap in the technology 
to make it scalable for that. So uh, that's a big issue. The energy consumption is another one. In order yeah. to make a blockchain truly secure, uh, mm -hmm. you need to have lots of computers committing lots of computing power um, to you know make sure that it's secure. And that has a cost on the environment. It's what's called an externality. Mm -hmm. And by some estimates, the amount of energy already that the Bitcoin blockchain is using is equivalent to that of Iceland or Cyprus, wow. which um, is pretty significant when you think about what, what it's currently doing. So we need to figure out a way to make blockchain scalable without um, compromising the environment. Mm. Um, will blockchain fall victim to um, the internet uh, in that it gets co-opted or controlled by powerful forces? We might think of them as corrupt governments like Iran or China or Russia, where the internet is anything but free. Could blockchain become um, controlled or co-opted by those powerful forces as well? Mm. Uh, so there are a lot of there are a lot of different issues here. Um, and the question really is, are these reasons that blockchain technology is a bad idea? Or are they implementation challenges yeah. to be overcome? And if they're implementation challenges, then the question is, how do we solve them? And again, I think the answer is multi-stakeholder governance. Mm -hmm. We need a new, we need a new way of thinking um, that allows everyone to come together in a constructive fashion, but not a hierarchical way, to solve these issues. And already we're seeing the early signs of um, the blockchain network coming into existence. So we've got groups like the MIT Media Lab, which mm -hmm. has a digital currency initiative that's doing important uh, work in the state. The Chamber for Digital Commerce, which is a trade organization based in Washington, D.C., which is acting as a critical interface between industry and the public sector. You've got um, actually groups from the Internet Governance uh, Network, like ICANN, um, who are looking at how they might uh, incorporate blockchain and Bitcoin technology into their work on Internet governance. Uh, and you've got Bitcoin foundations and groups all over the world who are trying to um, work with key stakeholders to, to push this forward in a positive way. Much more is needed. We need issues. We need we need groups to come together to figure out a lot of substantive issues, mm. uh, not least of which not least of which are the scalability and the energy use problem. Yeah. We need effective policy. We need to spread knowledge. We need to create standards for interoperability so that different blockchains that serve different markets can still communicate and operate with each other. Mm. All of these issues can only be solved. They can't be solved by government. They can't be, can't be solved by corporations with vested interests. Uh, they can only be solved through multi-stakeholder government. Yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, and I think you know co-creation in general is is definitely the way forward. Um, in a in an era where things are just moving so quickly, and you have so many vested interests at different um, you know parts of the economy, whether it is corporations, whether it's government, not for profits, foreign aid, etc. I think you just need that multi-stakeholder engagement. And um, you know, energy efficiency is an interesting one because I know Allied Control, um, a computer cooling firm, estimated that the total power consumption of the Bitcoin network um, was about 250 to 500 megawatts. Um, which basically equates to about three, enough to power 375,000 homes a year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I did some uh, calculations of my own. So apparently there's over 2 million cat videos on YouTube. So one minute of streaming consumes 0 0.0002 kilowatts of energy. So if each of these 2 million videos ran for just one minute and was streamed only 10,000 times, and that would consume 4,000 megawatts of energy. Um, and some of these, some of these, some of these videos go for minutes and the more popular cat videos have amassed more than 100 million downloads. So the next time someone uh, says, well, what about the energy efficiency? You just say cat videos. <laughs> well, that is, that is a funny but also deeply troubling. <laughs> deeply, deeply troubling. Uh, oh, my God. Couldn't wow, agree more. Amazing. And you know what? I haven't even well, accounted for the 6.5 billion cat pictures. So there's also that. <laughs> well, the other side to the energy debate is... Yep how blockchain might reduce the energy consumption of other uh, parts of the global economy. Mm -hmm. The financial services industry is a good example. So how many um, physical checks get printed every year on what's the carbon footprint of that? Mm -hmm. how, many brick and, how many brick and mortar banks are in the world that serve this dwindling and dwindling population and could potentially be repurposed? Um, and what's the carbon footprint of those banks? That's right. How about, say, the power grid? If everyone is able to generate their own power, and they can't, not because of blockchain, but because of revolutionary technologies 
like solar cells and battery power. Mm -hmm. If you have a tool like blockchain, which enables them to sell that energy in a peer-to-peer marketplace rather than selling it back into the grid, could that reduce our reliability on sources of of centralized power generation like nuclear, like coal, like natural gas, Mm. which in addition to not being clean, are actually extremely inefficient in how they deliver energy. Mm-hmm. Where most of the energy that's created, even at a natural gas plant, is usually considered one of the most efficient of fossil fuel power generation sources. Most of their energy is lost in heat, and then a great deal more of it is lost in transmission when it travels thousands of miles along the power line. Mm-hmm. So, what's the energy footprint um, reduction of incorporating a blockchain enabled distributed power grid? What is the potential for reducing the carbon footprint? from taking cars off the road because people don't own cars, they share them in a common mm-hmm. um, on a distributed application that enables peer-to-peer ride share. So again, there's all these other things that we haven't really even contemplated which could potentially have untold benefits on, um, on the environment and on the economy. Um, but that, again, that is not a reason to um, ignore the fact that running this technology takes energy. And if we can find a way to reduce it, we should. Yeah, perfect. Now that's that's makes a lot of sense. You've given our listeners a lot of food for thought, Alex. And um, I just wanted to um, wrap up. I know you're. Uh, it's about seven or oh, it's past seven p.m. over there in Toronto, Canada. So I want to let you go and get some dinner. But first, I want to ask you um, two hypotheticals and one question on lifestyle design. Uh, the first question is: If you could work for any company um, at any stage of their life cycle, who would it be and why? Well, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'd have to say my own firm, Northwest Path Ventures. Fair enough. That's the second. Uh, because, yep. Well, only because we're, we're at the intersection of all of this stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, my interest is in building world-changing blockchain companies. And I think that we're at the right moment in time to make that happen. So I'd have to say my own firm. Yep. No, it makes perfect sense. Um, second question is, if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Yeah. No, you can't get out of this one. <laughs> okay, I'll give you an answer. Um, I'm looking right now at the situation in, in the United States and, and Europe, um, the breakdown of political discourse mm-hmm. about how hard, nobody, there's a greater polarization of people are losing um, their belief in the credibility of government. And I think that has huge social implications that are already starting to play out. I'd love to ask someone like, Abraham Lincoln, Mm -hmm. who was able to see the United States through a civil war and reconcile some differences, albeit not completely, but managed to hold the Union together. What he thinks of the current state of political discourse and how we might propose a solution. Mm -hmm. Because I think that there are many solutions to be found in technology to a lot of the world's problems. I actually think that blockchain could be a powerful tool for increasing citizen engagement by making governments more accountable for what they do. Mm -hmm. Uh, Transparency is a good thing and it can have a big impact on government. But I think a lot of wisdom comes from past experience. And occasionally, um, you need that kind of wisdom to transcend all the bickering and all the division that exists in the world. That's a great answer. And finally, Alex, a question I like to ask entrepreneurs and people doing um, amazing things in the world is how do you stay on top of your game? I don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. No, more, more, more seriously, um, I actually thrive through interacting with people. Uh-huh. I think there's, there's a lot to be said for keeping on top of the articles and the news flow and the right. technology. But really, you need to understand what the people are actually building this future of here, how they're solving problems, mm-hmm. what they're developing. And so to that end, I have 10 to 20 conversations basically every single day with people all over, um, both in the blockchain industry and outside of it, the public sector, mm-hmm. um, in the not-for-government space. And that, in many instances, is to serve the end of the book or to help me with my business. But more often than not, it's just to um, improve my understanding of the state of the world and mm-hmm. to, as you said, stay on top of what's going on. Yeah, fantastic. Cool. And where can our listeners go to find out a little bit more about uh, the stuff you're working on, Alex, and also about the um, yet-to-be-released book. Well, um, for one, they can go to Amazon.com mm-hmm. um, to pre-order the book. It's available for pre-order now, and the release date in North America 
is on May the 10th, mm-hmm. where, which is when Amazon and retailers all over the continent um, will uh, open the floodgates. And actually, we're going to have um, Asian language, uh, Korean, Japanese, and, and uh, traditional Chinese wow. uh, available uh, this year, and uh, also in some uh, European languages as well, which will happen in the summertime. Mm-hmm. If you're interested in learning more about the book, I strongly encourage them to go to blockchain revolutioncom mm-hmm. also a place where they can pre-order the book, but also where they can learn a little bit more about uh, what Don and I are up to and, um, and read a little bit more about the book. And okay. the final thing I'll say is please follow me on Twitter because um, I'm pretty prolific and uh, I try and stay on top of it. Mm-hmm. What's the Twitter handle, Alex? Uh, at Alex Tapska. Easy. Cool. Well, thank you so much. You've been an amazing guest and definitely given our listeners a lot of food for thought around blockchain, Bitcoin, and, you know, what, you know, all the various distributed sort of applications are and some of the profound impacts it can actually have on people in developed and developing economies. So thank you again. Well, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for hosting us. Well, that's it for our show with Alex Tapscott. I hope you enjoyed that. You can find out a little bit more about Alex in the show notes on SoundCloud, iTunes, or Stitcher. If you like this program, make sure you share it um, with your networks, like it, subscribe, do all the wonderful things you can do on either either platform. So um, if you want to find out a little bit more about the podcast, you can do so at futuresquared.xyz. You can sign up to our mailing list there. You can find out a little bit more about Collective Campus and all the work we're doing at collectivecamp.us. Coming soon on the program, Program. We've got Evangelos Moody's and Garrett Dunham, so looking forward to bringing you those two gentlemen. But until next time, Future Squared out.